Item Number SCP-1592 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures All possible broadcasts of SCP-1592 are to be intercepted and blocked from public viewing. Intercepted broadcasts are to be stored in sight Video Archive Any civilians physically altered by SCP-1592's effects are to be brought into containment immediately and any witnesses to these alterations dosed with Class A amnestics. Viewing of SCP-1592 must be authorized by at least three personnel with Level 3 access clearance. SCP-1592 may only be shown to D-Class personnel. SCP-1592 is a television program entitled Paradise Television, which has demonstrated the capability to cause mental and physical abnormalities. It has the general format of a televangelist program, but discusses values and concepts unusual for such a program. The host of SCP-1592 is a middle-aged Caucasian male, who refers to himself as Pastor Harris. SCP-1592 consists of an as-of-yet unknown number of 15-minute broadcasts, all of which show Pastor Harris sitting on an armchair, looking directly at the camera while delivering a sermon. When an individual watches a broadcast of SCP-1592, they will become interested in the values and concepts it discusses, regardless of previous religious or moral orientations. Further viewing of SCP-1592 will result in the individual gradually becoming obsessed with SCP-1592 and neglecting other social obligations in order to continue viewing it. Affected individuals will often record broadcasts of SCP-1592 and watch them multiple times. After the affected individual has viewed a number of broadcasts ranging from 20 to 30, physical alteration will begin. This takes place over a period of one to two weeks. If the victim is stopped from watching SCP-1592 during this period, these alterations will cease, but any alterations already caused by SCP-1592 will remain. Initial physical alterations include the growth of additional sensory organs eyes, noses, etc. on various parts of the body. Pigment of the skin radically changing in color. Alteration of the vocal cords, preventing normal human speech. Elongation or shortening of the limbs. Fusion of body parts, fingers, toes, etc. Growth of non-human extremities, mandibles, pincers, etc. Later physical alterations often involve morphing of the body into non-humanoid forms, usually resulting in immobility. It is unknown if the victim is aware at this point, as none have responded to attempts at communication. Interview Log 1592-1 Interviewer Dr. Interviewed D-20122 Forenote D-20122 had watched 22 videos of SCP-1592 broadcast at the time of the interview. Severe elongation of the left arm and left leg were present. Alterations to the structure of D-20122's mouth resulted in some difficulty speaking. Hello, D-20122. Hello, Doctor. What, what time is it? It's five minutes past six. Why? Nothing. It's just that, that, uh, that usually when we had a test, you know, where I watch the videos and write them and everything, write, write down what they say. I'm sure that can wait a while longer, D-20122. The tapes aren't going anywhere. No, no, no. I need to see them now so I know what he has to say. If you just calm down. We can finish this interview and proceed with the test. How do you feel about your physical alterations? Well, I was I was worried at first, but it's like what Pastor Harris says on the video. It's so we share his pain, isn't it? It still hurts though when my bones change. And why are you so interested in what Pastor Harris is saying? Well, I don't really know what it is about it. It's just right, you know? Like it all feels right. So you are happy with SCP-1592's effects upon you? Very. End interview. 
Closing Statement D-20122 began final physical alterations one week after this interview. Sermon Excerpts The following are transcribed records of SCP-1592 broadcast by D-Class personnel who were assigned to view them. What is wrong with the generation of today? They don't understand sacrifice. Haven't felt his gaze on their skin. I hope that my viewers understand sacrifice. I pray to him for that every night. For you. For your souls. If you have a pet, it will play its part. You will share his hunger in the coming days, and the pet will sacrifice for you. If you don't have one to sacrifice and suffer for you, worry not, my children. Worry not, for he will provide. I have a message from a faithful child here, from Jenny in Colorado. She watches his word every night, and the carapace is growing. Jenny writes, Pastor Harris, sometimes I scream from the pain he gives me. I cannot feel my legs. Jenny, if I may address you for a moment, what you are feeling is the pain that he too has suffered for us in the black. You are one of the faithful, Jenny, and so you are worthy to take his image. This pain is simply sacrifice, as he has sacrificed for you. Stay strong, Jenny. I have stood in the ashes of society and walked through the bones of dead planets. Have you seen these things? Has he seen fit to grant you these pleasures? Not yet, but the form is changing. Perhaps you slide along the floor like a slug, or drag yourself along the floor as a… Soon his eyes will wrinkle in benevolence at you. In faithfulness, you will find reward. In sanctity, you will find his image. He has many faces and many maws, and they look down on you, judging, waiting, loving. Good night. By order of the Overseer Council, this file is subject to Level 4 classification. Level 4 clearance is required. Item Number SCP-008 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-008 samples have been deemed Class V extreme biological hazards, and all related protocols apply. Incineration and irradiation measures will be deployed in the event of political or military action, which may result in the facility being dismantled, a power failure, or zero communication from operatives or outside channels during any given eight-hour period. The quarantine period for operatives leaving the facility is four months. If a breach has occurred, incineration and irradiation measures shall be deployed. It should be the policy of all G-2 sites to not prepare an evacuation procedure. SCP-008 is a complex prion, samples of which are stored in each of the known G-2 sites. Research in the SCP-008A is highly classified, and primarily aimed at preventing research which may lead to the synthesis of SCP-008 in the distant future. Traits of the SCP-008A prion include 100% infectiousness, 100% lethality, transmission through exposed mucous membranes and all bodily fluids, not airborne or waterborne. Symptoms of infection with SCP-008 manifest no more than three hours after exposure, and include flu-like symptoms with high fever, plus severe dementia in later stages, coma onset approximately 20 hours after first symptoms appear and 12 hours after noticeable dementia. Coma onset will be considered onset of death. A period of sporadic cellular necrosis occurs, which comes to resemble gangrene. Surviving tissue assumes its original function, and is highly resilient. Red blood cells greatly increase oxygen storage capacity, resulting in slower blood flow, and increased muscle endurance and strength. Nervous and muscular systems are unaffected by total organ failure for several hours. Metabolism may decrease to extremely low levels, allowing subject to survive for over ten years without nutrition. High blood viscosity results in negligible blood flow from gunshot, puncture, or slashing injuries. Conditioned behavior, motor controls, and instinctive behavior mechanisms are damaged, 
and cognitive abilities are severely retarded and erratic. Animals experience excessive brain necrosis and are inactive. Subject can adapt to its damaged nervous systems, but is limited to basic physical activities, including standing up, balancing on two legs, walking, biting, grabbing, and crawling. Subject will energetically move towards sights, sounds, and smells it associates with living humans. Subject will attempt to ingest living humans if physical contact is made. Neutralizing fully infected subjects requires significant cranial trauma. There is strong evidence to suggest SCP-008 itself did not form naturally on Earth, since variants of similar complexity would have displaced much of the ecosystem. In 1959, a short collaborative effort with the USSR to locate G-2 sites and eliminate SCP-008 was negotiated following their discovery. The status of SCP-008 in Russian custody since collaboration ended is unknown. Addendum 008-1 SCP-500 has been found to be able to completely cure SCP-008, even in the advanced stages of the disease. Item number SCP-149 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-149, in any of its instances, is to be kept inside a sealed plexiglass box for observation. Oxygen and a nutrient mist are to be released into the containment cell every two hours. If any instance of SCP-149 escapes its cell, Protocol 42 Charlie is to be brought into effect on any and all contaminated personnel, by order of 05-12 after Incident 149-1. Description SCP-149 is a breed of mosquito which carries a strain of retrovirus, herein referred to as SCP-149-A, that mutates regenerating human cells into fertilized mosquito eggs. SCP-149-A is injected directly into the bloodstream when SCP-149 feeds. The SCP-149-A quickly works on the nucleus of the cells, warping the DNA. The first set of cells bred from these changed instructions closely resemble cysts, and are concentrated in the lining of the esophagus and the sinuses. Upon dissection, however, these cysts are revealed to be filled with SCP-149's larvae, the cyst acting as a protective casing against external forces. SCP-149 appears to go through its maturation cycle in a matter of hours. By the time the subject is able to feel any effects, the first generation of SCP-149 has already grown inside the subject's body. SCP-149 primarily achieves exodus through the mouth and nostrils, occasionally being diverted through the sphenoid sinuses to escape through the eye sockets. Infection by SCP-149 is fatal and chance of infection has been estimated to be 50% from one bite. Addendum Incident 149-1 An incident of SCP-149 escaped and infected multiple Class D subjects, the majority of whom did not report SCP-149's contact with them. Within five hours, SCP-149 had matured in these hosts and burst out of them, infecting staff. It was only thanks to the quick thinking of Dr. B who sealed sublevels 12 through 15, that the entire site was not infected. As a response to this, O5 Command has created Protocol 42 Charlie, to be used if SCP-149 escapes confinement. Item number SCP-2102 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-2102 is to be housed at Site-122 in an L-type humanoid anomaly containment cell HACC. This is to be modified to minimize the probability of injury to SCP-2102. SCP-2102 is to remain fully restrained at all times 
with its hands and feet encased within padded sleeves, to avoid accidental or intentional lacerations of its epidermis. SCP-2102 is to be considered a permanent Class Alpha Red security risk in light of its suicidal tendencies. In case of an unbounded ectoentropic reaction UER, all on-site personnel not specifically attached to this project are to be evacuated, and three members of security staff with at least L2-2102 clearance are to enter SCP-2102 cell to initiate its breach protocol. C-2102-PRT-PRCH-14A version 1.2 for more information. Following the incident, SCP-2102 is to be treated by attached Level 3 medical staff for any burns sustained during the incident. Excess tissue is to be excised, and the resulting wounds are to be cauterized immediately. This is currently the only reliable way to reduce the amount of tissue generated. Excised tissue is to be destroyed as per the standard biohazard disposal protocol. If its breach protocol fails, all Site-122 personnel with Level 3 security clearance have been provided with the pass key to this project's kill switch. This can be activated remotely, and doing so will trigger the dispersal of a dicyanoacetylene gas and powdered fluoridated aluminum within SCP-2102's containment cell. This mixture will be ignited automatically after a three-second delay. If the kill switch is not successful in deactivating SCP-2102, no further provisions have been made. SCP-2102 is an unidentified male of indeterminate age and descent. SCP-2102 measures approximately 178 cm in length and weighs an estimated 48 kg. 100% of SCP-2102's body is covered in hypotrophic scars, a result of the application of its breach protocol in order to halt past UER-2102 events. Due to this scarification, SCP-2102 is deaf, mute, and blind, and cannot be interviewed. All data on SCP-2102 was gathered from testing and from surviving GRU Division P documentation. SCP-2102's anomalous properties manifest when it suffers a puncture wound or laceration, initiating an anomalous wound healing process, designated a UER-2102 event. This process is instantaneous, and though both hemostatic and inflammatory phases occur as normal, the proliferative phase of the process occurs at a greatly increased rate, and no wound contraction occurs. Conservative estimations put angiogenesis, collagen deposition, granulation tissue formation, and epithelialization occurring at a rate of factor 10 to the 15 power higher than baseline human physiology. During a UER-2102 event, SCP-2102 will continue to produce new tissue at an exponential rate, unless all open wounds are successfully cauterized. Based on this, it is estimated that the culmination of an NK-class scenario would occur approximately four weeks post-event, should full neutralization not be achieved. Tissue generated during UER-2102 events will expand into any available open space. Obstructions are able to delay the expansion, but as more tissue is generated, it will exert a mounting pressure on materials. Currently. There is no upper limit to the MPA SCP-2102 is able to generate. Blunt force trauma that does not break SCP-2102's epidermis will not induce its anomalous properties, and the application of intense heat will cauterize any open lacerations, halting SCP-2102's anomalous wound healing. Tests have also indicated that SCP-2102's anomalous properties would in all probability not persist if all soft tissues were destroyed. Addendum 2102-A01 Notes on Recovery and Preliminary Containment SCP-2102 was recovered from the grounds of the Institute of Experimental Medicine SCAV in Czechoslovakia on December 2, 1972. Foundation agents embedded in the Czechoslovakian government 
had been aware of the existence of a GRU Division P project housed on the grounds of the Institute since earlier that year, and intelligence reports indicated its focus to be on the development of practical applications for rapid cellular regeneration. Following the successful appropriation of classified documentation detailing SCP-2102 and its anomalous properties, a recovery operation was planned for January 1973. On December 2, 1972, at 714 UTC, a disturbance was reported at the Institute of Experimental Medicine CSAV, and a large number of civilians were seen fleeing the premises. A small Foundation reconnaissance force, comprised of members from several mobile task forces stationed in Eastern Europe, was immediately dispatched to take stock of the situation before recovery was initiated. Preliminary containment was effected at 2301 UTC on December 2, 1972. Permanent containment on December 13, 1972. Addendum 2102A02 Excerpt from Reconnaissance Log 2102-OPREC-721202 Command Merrick, what is your location? Merrick, on the grounds, nearing the entrance to the bunker. Looks like it's wide open. No hostiles in sight. Command Copy that. You are cleared for approach. Good luck. Merrick, moving in. Merrick, the smell is off here. Can't put my finger on it. Jones, stop bumblefucking and watch that left hallway. Merrick. Mostly labs and offices. Found what looks like a break room a while back. Most of the files are gone, and what they left doesn't look important. Just paperwork on shipments, food, supplies, standard logistical stuff. Command. Take it anyway. Let IA figure it out. Any sign of the anomaly yet? The Foundation Intelligence Agency Merrick Roger, will do. No sign of the anomaly so far, but it might be on minus two or lower. Ashton, start grabbing every scrap of paper you can see. Command Keep your eyes peeled, Merrick. Merrick, copy that, Command. Merrick Almost done on minus one. Still no sign of the anomaly. Smells getting worse, though. We've located an elevator to the lower levels. We'll keep you posted. Command. We copy, Merrick. Proceed with caution. Merrick. Always. Jones. Ashton. We're going down. I want you to secure… wait. Command. Any seismic activity in this area? Command. Not that we know of, Merrick. Why? Merrick. I think I just felt something move down there. Merrick. Come in, Command. Elevator stuck. We went down maybe about a foot before we hit something. No idea what… Wait. What's that sound? Metal warping and tearing. Multiple screams and cries of alarm. Command. Come in, Merrick. What is your status? It's… Floor. Something's coming through. Pry those doors open. Indeterminate noise. Multiple voices. Grunting and yelling. Command. Come in, Merrick. Merrick, command. We've managed to open the doors and climb out. We've got an unknown amorphous mass coming up from the lower levels. Recommend immediate countermeasures. Command. Copy that, Merrick. We have two F-4s on standby at… They'll be with you in approximately seven minutes. Can you hold out? Semi-automatic weapons fire. Merrick. I have no fucking clue, command. Right now, we're trying every trick in the book, but every time we damage it, it seems to grow more rapidly. Ashton, see what a couple of lemons do to that thing. Multiple explosions. Merrick, command. I hope those birds you're sending have something on board that'll stick, cause nothing we're carrying seems to be stopping this thing. Command, don't worry, the guys in IA said they'd know how to deal with this. Get your team out of there, Merrick. Merrick, copy that. We're out of indeterminate loud noises. Command. Status, Merrick. Merrick. We're okay, but this thing just exploded through the topsoil and is still growing. Those birds better get here fast. Command. ETA approximately six minutes. How fast is it moving? Merrick. Jones, get out of there! Command. Merrick. What's going on? 
muffled cry. Merrick. We lost Jones. He just got sucked under that thing. I have no idea what his speed is, and I don't care. Get those birds here now! At 14.22.56 UTC, two F-4 Phantoms dropped their payload of M-47A-1 napalm incendiary bombs, successfully cauterizing the tissue generated by SCP-2102 during its UER-2102 event in progress. Addendum 2102-A03 Translated excerpt from captured GRU Division P documentation. The following selected diary entries were found amongst paperwork recovered from the Institute of Experimental Medicine CSAV. Their author could not definitively be determined. Date: March 2, 1972. Finally arrived. I swear, the Tupolev was shaken more than the BMP I rode in during my service. The equipment crates were already there, and mostly intact, though two chambers and a rentgen got mashed a bit on the train, and the mainframe looks rather unwell too. I met with the local staff I kept hearing such things about. Comrade Dr. Sanyi, their head of research, has some genuinely compelling ideas about test subject suitability index based on basal metabolic rate, the Minsk experiments, and a couple other things. Though that might have been the result of his Barak Palinka. Date: March 3, 1972. Turns out our and her three-phase plugs are somewhat different. I have a headache. Date: March 5, 1972. Good news. Me, Mikhail, Kuzma, and her technician Prasnovsky managed to swap the leads and everything, and fix up the broken kit with the spares he managed to dig out from somewhere. All of it works too. Bad news. As soon as we plugged in all of it for a test run, the fuses blew and we knocked out the power from half the Institute. I would have thought they prepared things to our specifications. Ugly news. Looking through their fusing diagrams, it took the three of us half the day to sort it out. Whoever drew these up should be scrubbing the cellars of the Lubyanka. At least we have some time to go sightseeing. There is a pretty amazing castle ruin nearby and since Comrade Dr. Orokova's sister works there, we can go for a private tour. Still, the project stagnating for reasons this stupid leaves a bitter aftertaste. Date: April 19, 1972 It took a couple of chats with the OMB board, the Institute's director, and one angry call to Moscow, but we had the power grid strengthened in record time. Take that, Watley and Weber. Oscar Watley and Norbert Weber two prominent British researchers on tissue regeneration. Both attended the 1970 World Congress on Experimental Medicine in Vienna, and may have met the author there. In other news, they brought in a couple of promising candidates today. Not ideal by far, but we will have to work with what we have. Soon, we will see if the theories are correct. P.S. The trip was a blast. Got Marussia a scar she will love, too. And what is better? Entire stock equals about a kilo of chewing gums. All it took was a roll of ruples to the shopkeeper. Date: May 5, 1972 The first subject looked promising at first. When we introduced trauma, rapid clotting took place as expected, but the process aborted soon enough, and lesions developed. Turns out Mihail mixed in far too much neodymium, the oaf. I swear this is the last straw. I told him if he fucks up again, I will drag his ass to Moscow by his collar. Date: June 28, 1972 Why do they keep dying? It does not make sense. Reducing the amount of neodymium actually made the necrosis worse. I cannot tell Mikhail that, or I will be hearing it for the rest of my life. Date: August 3, 1972 The cultivation is done, and Alina, MU Dr. Alina Orovkova, CSC, current whereabouts unknown, read, had a look at the histology. The results are interesting, almost like an equilibrium of sorts. The cells divide 50 times faster than in control samples, but they die off almost immediately too, until the whole thing chokes on its own waste, so to say, it is not pretty. It seems that to make this work, we need to shift that balance somehow. Date: August 15, 1972 so we got another candidate, the 16th since the start of the project. 
I had gone to Sillard, R.N. Dr. Sillard Sanji, D.R.S.C., say documentation on Operation Redemption Red, and told him we really needed someone more resilient than normal people. The Ministry came through. From what we heard, we got ourselves a counter-revolutionary who spent fifteen years in a uranium mine as punishment detail, and somehow came out fine. Sure enough, histology results point at his cells pulling a co-shade of Deathless, and his natural regeneration is about twice as fast as your average man, too. Who knows, this might be the one. Date: September 5, 1972 Preliminary results looking good. The wound healing process does not abort anymore, though perhaps it is completing a bit too rapidly. I cannot believe I just wrote that. Ha! <laughs> I wonder if we can refine the process, and perhaps even make it permanent. It is not our original goal, but if we manage this… Date: September 24, 1972 I am finding it increasingly difficult to sleep. X-16 is not like the others. He is not weak. The others never lasted more than one cycle, but X-16 has been lacerated so many times now, and each time he survives. Today, he somehow freed himself from the restraints and attempted to slit his wrists. I should be happy, because it means the effect now lasts several hours longer than we expected. But I cannot help but feel bad for him. I need some time off. Maybe Sillard will let me go see Marussia. Date. October 15, 1972 Finally, we have found the right composition. It turns out that we need a little more of the Stabilizing Agent Jury, Unknown Red, introduced a few weeks ago. It was staring us in the face all this time. Subject X-16 is responding well, in the medical sense at least. He is as uncooperative as ever. It does not matter. It will be done and over soon. Another little step towards our victory. When you think of it, the man is a hero, and he does not even know it. Date: November 3, 1972 Elena showed up in my section of the lab just as I was preparing another batch of the serum. She looked distraught, and practically dragged me off by the sleeve. Good reason, too. Long story short, the samples seemed to be gaining mass from nowhere. She thought it was a measurement error, but I got the same after spending the day calibrating the machines. I am very worried. I got into an argument with Sillard and Jury. They say it was bound to be an error and want to press on, while I and Alina want to look deeper into what the hell is happening. Date: November 26, 1972 There is a pattern to the increases in mass and… all over, and it is not just X-16 now. I feel the answer is at my grasp. I had it all worked out yesterday, but I woke up at my desk soon after. I really need more sleep. And Marussia, I miss her, but Sillard is not about to let me go. Date: November 27, 1972 We were ordered to stop working on sample analysis and focus on empirical tuning of the composition. Me and Alina appear to be the only ones with an ounce of common sense here. Just a few days more. Date: December 2, 1972 It is far too early to be up but I cannot sleep. Today is the day we either produce the very first super-soldier, or we start over with nothing. I really do not know which is better. Eh, tomorrow is a day too. There are no later entries in the diary. Item Number SCP-1509 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-1509 is kept in a secure storage locker at Storage Site-08. Access to SCP-1509 is restricted to testing and preservation work. Personnel who have suffered minor wounds as a result of SCP-1509 are to report to the on-site medical facility immediately where they are to be kept under observation. All objects discharged from the wound are to be contained by medical staff. All SCP-1509-1 instances are to be contained by medical staff and destroyed. Any person injured with SCP-1509 
is to be kept under observation until the wound is healed over, and an attending staff physician who has been briefed on the effects of SCP-1509 has given his signed permission to release the subject. In the case of non-Foundation personnel injured with SCP-1509, all subjects must be administered amnestics before release into the general population. In the case of a major or fatal injury arising from the mishandling or use of SCP-1509, the subject is to be moved to a secure medical facility within 30 minutes of receiving the injury. They are then to be sedated or restrained until the effects of SCP-1509 ceased, at which point the body is to be incinerated. SCP-1509-2 instances created during this process are to be immediately contained and interrogated. Should the SCP-1509-2 instance become violent, staff are permitted to terminate the instance immediately. Following the interrogation, the instances may be dealt with at the discretion of the current Level 2 staff member overseeing SCP-1509. Previous SCP-1509-2 instances have been dealt with in the following manners. Immediate termination Recruitment as D-Class personnel indefinite detention, and being dosed with amnestics prior to being released into the general population. SCP-1509 is a bladed weapon, similar to an Indonesian parang. It is approximately 63 cm in length, with a steel blade 48 cm in length and 11 mm thick at its widest point. The metal of the blade is partially tarnished. The object was recovered with a wooden sheath believed carved into a shape resembling a bird, possibly a cockatoo. The object's handle is believed to be a later replacement for the original hilt. SCP-1509 does not display anomalous effects unless its blade is used to injure a human being, henceforth referred to as the subject. Wounds caused by SCP-1509 are affected by anomalous spatial distortion. Any exploration of the wound finds that it has an unidentifiably large, possibly infinite depth. This phenomenon appears to only occur from outside inspection of the wound itself. The subject is not affected adversely by this anomaly, and the anomaly will not appear in medical imaging. Any foreign objects placed inside the wound and abandoned will disappear if they are placed any further into the wound than the wound should physically be able to penetrate. Depending on the type of wound inflicted with SCP-1509, one of two further anomalous effects, referred to as Effect 1509-1 and Effect 1509-2 will occur. Effect 1509-1 Effect 1509-1 typically occurs if the wound caused by SCP-1509 occurs in an extremity or is less than 7 cm in width. Initially, the wound heals extremely slowly, although blood flow from the wound is significantly lower than would be expected. Within three hours of being cut by SCP-1509, the wound left by SCP-1509 will release a group of feral ants, Monomorium feronis, usually numbering between 1 and 15 ants at a time. Examination has shown that these ants appear within the wound and crawl towards the opening ceaselessly from the point of their appearance, but the source of these ants has not been discovered. The ants do not appear to have any anomalous properties. Upon exiting the wound, the ants will attempt to move as far from the subject as possible, for reasons unknown. All ants discharged from the wound as part of Effect 1509-1 are classified as instances of SCP-1509-1. After a period of 12 to 8 hours following the injury, the wound will begin to heal at an accelerated rate until it is fully closed. At this point, Effect 1509-1 appears to cease. Effect 1509-2 Effect 1509-2 occurs when SCP-1509 inflicts a wound on the torso, neck, upper arms, or thighs greater than 7 cm in width. Although the effect can occur on rare occasions in other bodily locations which have suffered an SCP-1509 induced wound of significant size. Like Effect 1509-1, the wound will typically heal at very slow rate, 
and blood loss from the wound will be significantly lower than what would normally be expected of such a wound. However, within three hours of being cut, the subject will begin to feel nauseous, complaining of unpleasant sensations of movement from within the area of the wound. Over the next hour, these sensations will grow more intense and become acutely painful for the subject, who will typically react with panic to these events. Once the subject begins to feel pain from the sensations, Effect 1509-2 enters its final stage. Over a period of between 20 and 180 minutes, an instance of SCP-1509-2 will force its way out of the wound, apparently propelled by peristalsis. SCP-1509-2 is the collective designation for the human beings created or produced by Effect SCP-1509-2. Instances vary in size, apparent physical age, gender, ethnicity, and most other physical differentiators. The instance is typically covered in a thin membrane similar to an amnion and a clear fluid. Typically an instance of SCP-1509-2 would be unconscious and immobile, but alive during the process of Effect 1509-2. But certain instances will emerge fully conscious and physically attempt to speed the process. After emerging from the wound, such instances will fall unconscious. This process significantly widens the wound and causes extreme pain to the subject. Instances of SCP-1509-2 show anomalous levels of flexibility during this process, being able to pass through wounds which should not be able to accommodate their size. Effect 1509-2 is universally fatal to the subject. If the subject survives the massive trauma caused by the process, they will quickly lapse into unconsciousness, followed by death. SCP-1509-2 instances are anatomically and genetically identical to normal humans. Each instance of SCP-1509-2 is genetically identical to, claims to be, and shares identical memories to a deceased person familiar with the subject, who has died within the past 30 years for reasons other than old age. If a wound is made using SCP-1509 on a subject who has committed murder, manslaughter, or has simply been responsible directly for the death of a human being, the instance of SCP-1509-2 produced is typically one of their victims. No instance of SCP-1509-2 will be able to recall anything following their death and prior to their gaining consciousness following expulsion from the wound. Addendum. SCP-1509 was recovered from the personal collection of antiquities collector who had apparently collected it from an archaeological excavation at Indonesia. Based on information he provided and independent investigations undertaken by the Foundation, it is believed that SCP-1509 was used as a punishment for murderers by an unknown society living in pre-Islamic Indonesia. Strict rules existed as to the correct implementation of SCP-1509, restricting its use to criminals and elderly, or extremely sick volunteers. The society which made use of SCP-1509 appears to have had a strong association between Eretz, cockatoos, and the concept of death and rebirth. Item number SCP-2790 Object Class BFF Special Containment Procedures SCP-2790 is contained in a Class II deep water aquatic containment tank in Site-54, where it cannot be touched. As of this time, personnel are freely invited to splash around and play with him. SCP-2790 should not be touched, and must always be hand-fed. All forms of physical contact with 2790 are allowed and encouraged except touching. Rub his belly while feeding him, especially while feeding him treats. He loves treats. Hug him before and after playtime. Personnel that do not wish to make contact with 2790 should be coerced into playing with him. SCP-2790 must be loved with lots of care. Poke him and prod him and hug him and squeeze him and rub against him and play with him, but don't touch him. 
Personnel that touch 2790 will be severely punished. SCP-2790 should be periodically transferred to other sites, as part of a pilot program to improve General Foundation morale. While he is away on outreach, personnel feeling lonely should massage themselves, since their skin will make them feel just like him. SCP-2790 is a male Atlantic Cranch Squid, Tuthawenia Megalops. He was initially recovered during a raid on the Curio Shop, Curios of the Worlds feeling lonely and sad in a tinted glass tank labeled Ignore. It was unclear why anybody would want to hurt 2790, or make him unhappy. SCP-2790 is endearing, snuggly, sociable, easygoing, and enjoys playing games. All forms of physical contact with 2790 except touching are encouraged. For example, SCP-2790 can be stroked, cuddled petted, and caressed. He especially loves cuddling. If he is lonely for too long, he will try to breach containment to find his friends. Close physical contact is the optimal method to keep him contained. Doctors Romero and Srinivasan lead the research on maintaining skin-to-skin -skin contact with 2790 for extended periods of time so that he doesn't feel lonely. Addendum 2790-1 Initial Test of a team of personnel playing with SCP-2790 in shifts resulted in increased containment breach rates from zero per week to zero per day. In addition, 2790's morale decreased significantly. Other proposals for maintaining contact with 2790 have been put forth, such as cloning him and providing each staff member with a clone to carry around, grafting skin from him onto each member of personnel, etc. For a full list of proposals, See Document 2790-2 Addendum 2790-2 After debate, the proposal to graft skin from SCP-2790 onto all personnel is passed, citing the ability to be connected with 2790 without being in contact, and the smoothness, softness, and loveliness of his skin. Junior researcher Romero collected a sample of skin from 2790 after horsing around with him. All biotechnology labs in Site-54 have been directed to grow clone cultures of cute skin from Romero samples. Addendum 2790-3 As of March 14, 189 personnel have volunteered for grafting trials. Although 72 had to be rejected for health reasons, 117 personnel were selected to test the initial grafts by replacing their uglier, callous skin on their hands with 2790's perfect, supple skin. Addendum 2790-4 As of April 25th, enough supple skin has been grown for the grafting procedures. All graft surgeries proceeded smoothly with no complications. The test subjects have been given immunosuppressant medications to minimize rejection of the perfect skin. Addendum 2790-5 As of August 3rd, only 87% of test subjects had suffered complications from the grafting procedures, which were relatively minor. Specifically, unexplained rejection of 2790's gorgeous skin and post-transplant infection. 70% of all personnel report the onset of tissue necrosis at the grafting site and the surrounding area, indicating that their bodies recognize the imperfection of their own skin and are removing them for 2790's skin. Additionally, 2790's morale and site morale have increased dramatically. His breach rate has also decreased from zero breaches per day to zero. Given the strong success rate of the preliminary test, more skin is being produced and all personnel are being prepared to undergo the grafting procedure. Addendum 2790-6 As of October 21st, all personnel in Site-54 have undergone the grafting procedure to their hands. 2790's breach rate has decreased to an unprecedented zero breaches per day, and his morale has increased dramatically. All personnel report feeling closer and more connected to him, citing the ability to rub the entire body with SCP-2790 skin. To further reduce the breach rate, plans are being made to totally replace the rough, monstrous skin of all personnel with 2790's gorgeous skin. Note, Site-54 has been quarantined at this time 
and is inaccessible. As the page for SCP-2790's documentation has been locked from Site-54, it has been retained to illustrate the necessity of all mimetic, info-hazardous, incognito-hazardous screening protocols when acquiring new SCPs, despite the inconvenience posed by said protocols. Item number SCP-4419 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Due to the expansive range of circumstances in which SCP-4419 manifestations occur, containment efforts are to focus on information control and post-manifestation cleanup, rather than physical imprisonment. Any witnesses to an SCP-4419 manifestation are to be dosed with a Class B or Class A amnestic, as appropriate for their level of exposure. In cases where it is possible to restore the bodies of SCP-4419 victims to roughly standard human configurations, a cover story is to be established to explain any remaining damage as a result of their original injuries. In cases where this is not feasible, victims of SCP-4419 are to be brought into custody and if possible, euthanized. A cover story is then to be established regarding the death of the victim due to their original injuries or conditions. SCP-4419 is a vehicle resembling an ambulance of Varian make and model, which will spontaneously appear in an area shortly before a medical emergency rises. The means by which SCP-4419 predicts these situations is currently unknown. Although the appearance of SCP-4419 differs from manifestation to manifestation, it will always resemble an ambulance appropriate for the local culture. Upon the occurrence of the medical emergency, SCP-4419 will proceed directly to the injured individual, hereafter referred to as the victim. Two individuals of varying physical appearances in paramedic uniforms will then exit from the back of SCP-4419 secure the victim, and bring them back with them into SCP-4419. The individuals that emerge from SCP-4419 will behave as expected for a medical professional in the situation, but will repel any attempts by others to prevent them from securing the victim via extreme physical force. Once the victim has been secured within SCP-4419, it will leave the area at extreme speeds, disappearing the moment it is outside of observation. Two to seven days later, the victim will be returned outside a local area, suffering from extreme and invasive bodily modifications. Although the majority of these alterations would logically result in the death of the victim, death will not occur in these cases unless the modifications are tampered with or otherwise undone. The specific nature of these modifications differs from case to case, although there does appear to be a level of correlation with the original medical emergency. See Encounter Log 4419-1 Encounter Log 4419-1 The following is a log of encounters with SCP-4419, the original medical emergencies in each area, and the bodily modifications applied to the victim. Note that this log does not encapsulate all known SCP-4419 victims, and a full record is available upon request from the Data Archive at Site-31. Date, Medical Emergency, Bodily Modification February 7, 1983 A braking car hits a pedestrian crossing the street, resulting in a broken leg. Victim returned with all limbs amputated and relocated to protrude directly from his torso. Limbs were re-amputated and a cover story was established to explain the loss of limbs as a result of a much more severe car accident. November 23, 1994 A man suffers from a broken jaw following a fight outside a bar. Victim returned with his jaw forced permanently open. In addition, a glass window was installed in the mouth to permit viewing of the heart, which had been relocated to the back of the throat. Due to the relocation of the heart, reversion of the body modifications was not possible, and the victim was euthanized. June 19th, 
1999. A homeless man suffers from a drug overdose. Victim returned to the same place he was originally taken from. The top of the victim's skull had been removed, and the brain crudely scooped out and placed into the victim's hands, which had been fused together in front of him. While being brought into custody, the victim's brain fell out of his hands and he instantly expired. Note that at no point was the victim's brain actually connected to his nervous system. January 29, 2003 A wife and husband involved in a car crash suffered numerous broken bones and severe bleeding. Victims returned fused together by their backs. All bones that had been broken in the original accident were meticulously removed, resulting in the loss of use of some limbs. The victims were successfully separated, administered amnestics as appropriate, and their modified limbs were amputated. February 15, 2006 An elderly man suffers from a heart attack. Victim was returned with eleven additional and non-functional hearts within his body stuffed between his existing organs. Expiration occurred when surgeons attempted to remove these additional hearts before agents could arrive on the scene. Surgeons and medical staff who had treated the victim were administered amnestics, and the body confiscated. September 19, 2008 A fire at a bar results in 19 people suffering from severe burns. An additional seven people suffer from skull fractures and broken bones when they attempt to confront the individuals who emerge from SCP-4419, and are also taken as victims. It is believed existing injuries were exasperated and new injuries caused by attempting to force 26 people into the limited space with an SCP-4419. Victims return to the local community center as a single watery mass, which twitches and shivers when physical contact is applied. As no method of euthanizing the victims could be found, they are currently stored in a liquid tank at Site-31. November 24, 2014 a U.S. military private is shot while on patrol in Afghanistan. Due to the suspicious nature of SCP-4419's arrival and the forceful securing of the private, other soldiers on the patrol fire upon SCP-4419 as it leaves. Witnesses report seeing a viscous black fluid leaking from the resultant bullet holes in SCP-4419's surface. Victim is found broken down to a thin paste and spread over the walls of their barracks the next day. The agents who initially secured the remains reported seeing a mostly intact eyeball dilate when they approached. Although what has been brought into storage is referred to for convenience's sake as remains, it is currently not known whether or not the victim has expired. Item number SCP-427 Object Class Safe See Containment Procedures Special Containment Procedures SCP-427 displays no means of self-locomotion or malicious intent at this time, and requires only minimal containment. Due to SCP-427's adverse effects, only medical staff of Class III or above may handle or utilize it. All personnel using SCP-427 must record their total time using it in order to avoid unwanted mutations. Instances of SCP-427-1, colloquially referred to as Flesh Beast, created by SCP-427 must be killed immediately, as it is impossible to communicate with or experiment on them safely. For this reason, instances of SCP-427-1 are classified as Keter. Description: SCP-427 is a small, spherical, ornately carved locket made of a polished silver material. The ornate carvings do not seem to serve any function. It is unknown whether SCP-427's outer casing was crafted by sentience or not. Its circumference at its widest point is roughly 3 cm. SCP-427 was created after placing a pill of SCP-500 in the input booth of SCP-914 and using the find setting. It displayed no unusual activity when closed. When opened, a small glowing orb is visible in the center. The orb emits no radiation or energy aside from the visible spectrum. 
When SCP-427 is opened and exposed to biological tissue, it rapidly regenerates cellular damage and somehow is able to purge invading compounds or infections. As a standard of measure, the common cold takes 3-10 days to be worked through the human immune system and eventually removed. In the presence of an opened SCP-427, this time is reduced to 2-4 minutes. Its healing abilities are directional, so anything not in line of sight with the central orb experiences no effects. However, long-term exposure produces a significant health hazard. As the locket heals damage, it optimizes the body's natural systems. Resistance to disease and toxins is increased by 500% compared to accepted LD50 or death rate values after a total of 10 minutes of exposure, and 1000% after 15. After 15 minutes of exposure, muscular systems begin optimizing, increasing strength and pain tolerance by 200-300%. All other systems continue to optimize. Class D personnel exposed to the device for over an hour total began mutating into a shapeless mass of tissue. The conversion time accelerates with continued exposure to SCP-427. The Flesh Beast, so named due to their appearance, created by SCP-427 are incredibly aggressive, attacking any and all personnel on sight with lethal results. They are highly resistant to most known weaponry, but can be disabled with sufficient shock trauma or heat in excess of 1,100 degrees Celsius or 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Intelligence cannot be accurately gauged, but mapping of biological enhancement of the brain has a direct relationship with optimization of other systems suggests intelligence could exceed levels measured in humans when fully transformed. SCP-427 is currently being used as a partial replacement for SCP-500 pills, as it can cure almost anything SCP-500 is able to. All optimizations imparted by SCP-427 are cumulative. Oversight has deemed the side effects an acceptable risk, but users must carefully record their total exposure time, as sufficient mutations are ground for termination. Item Number SCP-2126 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-2126 is to be kept in an opaque plastic sleeve and held within a moisture-controlled storage locker. SCP-2126 is a letter written in blue ink on a ruled sheet of P-4 paper. It is addressed to a person identified as Davy and appears to be written by said person's grandmother. Two horizontal creases in the paper suggest that it was at one point folded into thirds and placed in an envelope. It reads as follows. January 3, 1970 My dearest Davy, it was so nice to see you for Christmas last week. I always enjoyed the time we spend together, especially now that you are studying at university. I can't believe my little Davy is going to be a doctor. Still, I wish you had decided to attend a school that wasn't on the West Coast. There are plenty of good schools here in New England. You could have been close enough to visit all the time. Besides, I think those California boys have become a bad influence on you. I can't imagine you going to church with your hair growing out like this. When you were turned around, I almost mistook you for your sister. But I'm just a silly old woman. I guess boys will be boys. Or girls. These are strange times. Which much love, Grandma. When SCP-2126 is read aloud from beginning to end, all the reader's hair follicles will immediately cease normal function and begin to pull hairs downward through the dermis and into adjacent tissues. The mechanism producing this effect is unknown and currently under investigation. Once there is no more hair above a particular follicle, the follicle will begin contributing cells to the inward growing hair. The process proceeds at a rate of 1.25 cm per month, approximating the average rate of human hair growth. The process ceases for follicles producing body hair once the hair reaches the length the follicle would produce normally, such as for vellus and androgenic hair. 
but will proceed indefinitely for cranial hair should the person affected have live follicles within the dermis of their scalp. Autopsies have shown that the inverted hairs of individuals affected by SCP-2126 will grow uninhibited even through particularly dense tissues, such as cartilage and bone. Following greatly reduced mobility caused by hair growing through muscle and nerve tissue, death by SCP-2126 occurs once vital organs are sufficiently penetrated. Reading recorded video, photographs, photocopies, or transcripts of SCP-2126 does not produce this effect. Addendum. The effect of SCP-2126 can be temporarily halted with chemicals that prevent hair growth, or by surgical removal of follicles, as the affected individual's body will quickly produce new follicles to replace those removed. The effect can be permanently halted only through surgical removal of the dermis. Item number SCP-1046 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures the building currently integrated with SCP-1046 is to be contained in a standard domicile containment unit. All surfaces contacting the building are to be constructed out of wooden materials. In the event of a containment breach, all portions of SCP-1046 found outside of containment are to be surgically removed and transplanted into the original building or a suitable replacement building. Description. SCP-1046 is a collection of 781 separate human body parts, formerly a man named The portions of SCP-1046's body are alive and fully functional, despite not receiving any sustenance or containing any blood. SCP-1046 is located within the former home of Portions of SCP-1046 are located throughout the home with some portions of the body replacing utilities within the home, such as portions of the skin replacing three curtains and a lampshade, and some inhibiting functions of objects within the home, such as a sink being clogged by an artery, and a large portion of the face being permanently affixed to the living room television. At random intervals, portions of SCP-1046 will shift throughout any non-biological surface into which they are currently integrated. This shift can take anywhere from 45 minutes to several weeks. Additionally, the portion of the face integrated into the television, and any other portion of SCP-1046 capable of producing sound, will begin to make distraught vocalizations. Faucets located within SCP-1046 will begin to produce small amounts of saline during this time, despite the building not being connected to any water source. SCP-1046 was discovered on September 18, 1994, after Foundation assets in the Davy Sheriff's Department followed up on reports of a quote, house with people parts, unquote. Investigation into the alleged house revealed SCP-1046's anomalous properties. Subsequent surgical intervention allowed agents to achieve successful containment. SCP-1046 was contained on November 19, 1994 and classified as Euclid. Similarities between SCP-1046 and SCP-1582 have been noted, and investigation to a similar origin of the two phenomena is currently ongoing. Addendum. Documents recovered from the residence SCP-1046 was located in have proven to be relevant to SCP-1046's current condition. Further investigation to the Malva Real Estate Corporation are ongoing. The letters were found in a bureau drawer and appear to be copies of letters that were sent to an unknown party. Dear Mr. Bayer, Recently I moved into one of your company's marvelous new homes and found it to be quite luxurious. The ads are right, you really do feel like part of the home. However, I am writing you this letter due to the fact that my new house no longer contains the bedroom. Would it be possible to get a contractor out here to remedy the situation? Sincerely. Dear Mr. Bayer, I don't believe you've received my last correspondence, and as such I am writing you again. Since you did not send a contractor as I requested, I have decided to hire one of my own. Unfortunately, several injuries sustained on my property compelled them to leave without finishing. 
I once again compel you to remedy the error. Sincerely. Mr. Bayer, this is the third time I have contacted you, and I do not believe your ignorance of my issue is accidental. I demand that you send a contractor to finish my home at once. It is unacceptable for a gentleman of my stature to be reduced to sleeping in the living room. If my home is not supplied with a master bedroom within the next three weeks, I will be forced to summon my lawyer. To those who it may concern, I am alone and trapped in dark. I am all over. I feel the creaks of the beams. I taste the staleness of the wall. I am dry. I need my bedroom. Several days into the donning of the sincere letter sent to an insincere man, he said I would be my house. I am a man. Don't take me anymore, please. I can't get sleep. The remainder of the note is unintelligible.